Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Penn State College of Medicine COVID-19 Echo Series for Skilled Nursing Facilities. We're delighted to have you join us for today's session. My name is Jackie Sable. I'm a member of the ECHO team, and I'll be facilitating today's session. A few quick announcements before we begin. If you've not already done so, please put your name, email address, and affiliation in the chat box for our record keeping purposes. Please stay muted unless you're speaking. You can use star six on your phone or the microphone icon on the bottom left-hand corner of your Zoom screen to mute and unmute. You can also use the chat for communicating. We realize that question and answer time is important to you, and we try to categorize and address as many questions as possible during the session, but any unanswered questions we will always address in a follow-up email. If you have suggestions for future COVID-19 ECHO topics, please share them via the chat tool, or you can email us at echo at psu.edu. Please remember that if we do if we do discuss any cases, no personally identifiable information or PHI is allowed. We are recording these sessions and we share all materials and recordings afterwards. In the spirit of all teach, all learn, we'll be on a first name basis during the session. Today's session will include a brief lecture and discussion on COVID-19 and retirement communities. What is the new normal looking like by Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner. This will be followed by a question and answer period. During the lecture, please feel free to put your questions into the chat. We have a team of specialists from Penn State Online. They'll help to field questions, but remember that this is all teach, all learn, so everyone can share both questions and answers. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Gavin. Thank you, Jackie. Hi, everyone. So for the last, gosh, nearly three months, since February, I've been working in long-term care facilities, uh, assisted living, nursing homes, memory care, retirement communities, uh, in about five states, helping them with training, just in time training, with preparation for possible uh, virus transmission, COVID-19 patients within their community and their facilities. And today I wanna to share, share with you some of those training approaches and methodologies that I've been using, and also some of the, the things that I've learnt uh, working in many of these nursing homes and long-term care facilities in the five states. So I'm gonna talk about retirement communities as an overall topic. Remember that it represents assisted living, nursing homes, memory care, veterans homes, and many other uh, long-term care facilities and talk about what's the, norm, nor, the new normal looking like. So what's really important is that from the onset was that uh, associates or the frontline workers that work in these long-term care facilities are essential employees. And it was really interesting, we had this discussion as, we, as, as governors and mayors and other uh, political leaders throughout the country told us about you know, staying at home and the importance of physical distancing these essential employees still had to travel from work to their facility. They still had to go out and do grocery shopping. They still had to do other necessary tasks that were part of them getting either to work or from work. And what we found was that many of them didn't have identification. For example, here's my Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center ID for the Department of Emergency Medicine at the hospital in Boston. And what's interesting on the back of my uh, hospital ID is a statement that says, I'm an essential employee. So during a disaster, I'm an essential employee that may be required to report to the hospital. And I've actually had to use this now numerous times in the different states that I've been to. I've been stopped by police. Um, I've been uh, in areas where people, where are you going? What are you doing? And I've been able to flash or show my ID card to show that I'm an essential employee. And what I found in uh, nursing homes, for example, many of the employees or the associates did not have any ID like this. They didn't have anything to show that they were an essential employee. So what did we do about that? And this is not just for, this, is, it's, this includes the, um, the, the direct care staff, the, clean, the housekeeping staff, the receptionists, uh, it includes the maintenance staff, as well as the kitchen staff, the laundry staff, and many others. And so we started again issuing 
letters to show that the, the, the define them as essential employees. We gave them business cards that showed where they worked at a particular facility. But this in some states and in some locations has proved to be very challenging. So it was important that we you carried some sort of identification to show that you're an essential employee. The other lesson that I've learned going to all these different facilities, there's probably around about 60 that I've been to, and I'm actually talking to you from one today. I've, I've been training all day, running a workshop uh, with uh, many of the staff in this particular nursing home. I've just taken a break to, to give this, this uh, presentation to you, but one of the, a, a recurring theme that I'm finding in all the facilities I go to is they are drowning in paper documents just like we are in the hospital. And one of the emergency departments that I work in, we received 35 PDF documents. And then, you know, the executive board, the nursing director and other uh, uh, important people in the hospital would bring us up and say, did you read docu document number seven? No, I haven't had time to read document number seven. So the same thing here in nursing homes, they received lots of documents that was telling them uh, sort of from a, a top down perspective, how to do things. And it wasn't bottom up, it wasn't helping them uh, look at their own situation and understand what the hazards are, what the threats are, and what they need to protect and what they need to do to decrease risk in the many different rooms and locations they work at in long-term care facilities. And so knowing that everyone, essential employees everywhere are drowning in paperwork and those paper, that paperwork is not translating very well to actual how-to or operational needs, we sit down and started discussing what are the dilemmas? What are the, what's the situation dilemmas you're facing? What would you do when you don't have enough staff, for example? Enough space when you have to isolate uh, uh, either uh, suspected or uh, lab laboratory diagnosed COVID-19 patients or any other diseases. Remember, we're not just focusing on SARS coronavirus 2, the, the virus that causes COVID-19. We're also, you know, we could also have other uh, medical conditions that we need to uh, uh, focus on and, and meet the needs of our residents. What happens when you run out of stuff or you have to order more stuff and where do you put it? And what do you do about some of the, the money things? Because we're buying new things all the time, things that, things that are so unfamiliar to long-term long uh, long -term assistant facilities. And so, after asking you know, that, that is those general questions, what do we do with, when we don't have enough space, stuff, uh, and staff, what can we do to prevent or minimize bad outcomes? And one of the things I found really interesting of all the nursing homes and assisted living facilities I've been to, when I talked about the word risk, a four letter word, it wasn't being used in any of the meetings I was attending. It wasn't used by the frontline workers. It wasn't used by staff. And it wasn't discussed that there may be risk that we have to mitigate. So one of the starting areas that, I have, I've, I've, that I've initiated in all the nursing homes I work in is how to do your own risk assessment. And then again, this for me and the experiences that I've had, this was a very new, unfamiliar concept that we don't just do one risk assessment. We each of us individually have to be doing, we have to conduct and do many risk assessments, a number of risk assessments throughout the day as we move between residents that have maybe different age groups, uh, different, uh, different underlying medical conditions, different situations that we've got to be aware of. They may, it may be memory care where they need a lot more hands-on help, for example. So I started teaching people how to do their own risk assessments. And the way that I started doing that was, I thought maybe we'd look at, let's look at what you do on a good day when you have maybe the flu season, the influenza um, cases in, in your facility, or there's a norovirus outbreak, you've got a lot of diarrhea and possibly vomiting. And when I went through the paperwork as well as staff actually physically through drills and exercises and walkthroughs showed me what they did for influenza and norovirus, from my risk assessment, I decided that wasn't enough. We have to have to uh, increase the vigilance in infection prevention control measures. We have to look at transmission precautions and ensure, and ensure that we identify the risks there and mitigate the hazards and the risks through being more vigilant, but working in a, in a very different way. So the influenza norovirus paperwork and protocols were, were a good starting point, a good platform, but it wasn't everything. So we went back and said, right, SARS-CoV-2, it's a new virus, it's a novel, it's a novel coronavirus. It causes the disease COVID-19. Let's treat this as an infectious agent 
and again, that has no cure and no vaccine. What do we need to do? And as part of our risk assessment, I, I, I printed out templates. And here's a template that I use that shows that risk is a function of both the likelihood of something happening and the consequences of that event actually happening. And so I printed out this template you see on the right hand side of this slide, which shows likelihood consequences from very low to very high risk. And I went through a couple of what if scenarios so that all the staff that I worked with could get familiar with understanding how to identify hazards, how to interpret those hazards they've identified and how to put them into a risk assessment and identify what the next steps or the mitigation steps are they need to, to protect themselves, their building, their environment, as well as their residents. So I'd start them off with a, a, a bit of a case, a bit of a scenario. You're in an open field you're next to a very hungry, aggressive adult tiger. The tiger is unrestrained and sees you as food. What's the likelihood of the tiger attacking you? And what's the consequences if that tiger attacks you? And then I went to another one where you're in a zoo observing a caged adult tiger, which is well fed, has a mild temperate. And as you can see on the first graph here, it's a high likelihood, high consequence. But if you put that tiger in a cage that's still really hungry, but can't get out of that cage, the likelihood of it attacking you is lower and the consequences still remain about the same. Or if you're holding a tiger cub with a playful temperament, and that tiger cub can bite you, yeah, it'll bite you. That's the likelihood of it biting is high, but the consequences of a young tiger cub, well, it's not gonna do a lot of damage. It's not gonna hurt you too much, and it may not even eat you as well. So we practice these three, three, these three what if scenarios to identify this is your very first risk assessment. And I said, now you've done a risk assessment if there was a tiger in the room. Now let's apply that same approach, identifying the likelihood of something happening and the consequence if that happens to say SARS-CoV-2 causing the COVID-19 COVID disease. And the next step of it was, was, well, people said, where do we start? Well, tell me, just describe to me what your work activities are. And then from your activities, identify those hazards. And then from those hazards, let's determine the risk and decide whether for a virus that we've never seen before, it's a new virus, it's a novel virus, we have no immunity to it, it has no cure and no vaccine, whether the risk is acceptable or not. If, it is, if it's yes, then you proceed with the work and you monitor for controls. If no, then we look at how do we prepare the necessary means, whether it be engineering, administrative or personal protective uh, equipment controls into an action plan. And then how do we implement those control measures? And then how do we constantly review and improve in a continuous improvement cycle, improve what we're doing and use any lessons learned. And we talked about for SARS-CoV-2 that we're all trying to do physical distancing because that's important because we know the, the virus spreads through droplets or through direct contact by touching something on our, a, a surface with the virus and putting it onto our face. We know we have engineering controls, administrative controls, and we know that the least effective of all those controls is our personal protective equipment. And I found that many of the staff in the hospitals I work with had very little experience in using personal protective equipment. And if we looked at those four, by, four primary controls, engineering, maybe the room's got negative air pressure, a HEPA filter, we can create zones, and I'll show you in, amount, uh, show you in this presentation some of the ways that we create zones and identify using uh, a color scheme of where different risk is, is located. Physical barriers and how we've put, put physical barriers into nursing homes. Administrative controls, medical surveillance programs. We do wellness checks. All the facilities I do each day do a wellness check where they take the temperature of all of the staff, not just once, but throughout the day. They also ask them a series of questions of how they're feeling. We've also created buddy systems to do temperature checks, and I'm going to explain more about that. And then we looked at personal protective equipment. No, there's a supply chain issue at the moment. We don't have everything we need. What are you wearing? And what you're using and wearing, does it provide you the necessary protection you need from this virus, from the droplets, droplet spread in the environment or the room that you're working in? 
And a lot of the risk assessments that we started for, for nursing homes started with a floor plan, a map. Where are the residents? Where are the elevators? Where are the stairwells? Where are the ante rooms where you can put on and take off your personal protective equipment? Where's the kitchen? Where's the laundry? Where are, where are all the areas where you've got uh, available uh, water, running water, where you can use uh, soap uh, and wash your hands frequently and often and properly and effectively? Where's the areas where you don't have water and we have to put hand sanitizers in there? Where are those areas based on risk, based on their residence, their age, their underlying medical, uh, medical uh, uh, conditions, and how do we identify that? And so what we came out with was using the traffic light system uh, of red, yellow, green, we could then start to identify from a floor plan where there may be a high risk resident, where, where risk may be because we're going to be more crowded and our, our, uh, the density of people will be closer together will be another area for high risk. Uh, we may not have a ventilation system in some rooms and we, there's only one way in and one way out. And so we started color coding uh, on the floor plans, red meaning there's high risk and we have to be uh, cautious and we actually said what are the what are the cautions we need to take. Yellow may be an area where we're transitioning from either putting on personal protective equipment or taking off or maybe just an entry area where we do our wellness checks each day. And then those green areas, those green areas where we know at this stage uh, the residents may not maybe still be in their rooms or if they have access to being escorted around or the staff are, are cleaning, you know, just a whole plethora of, of things that we put into our, our, our discussions on, on what makes an area uh, coloured in green. And we did that for all the different facilities with the first floor, second floor, third floor, fourth floor, and we identified areas of hazard and also then translate that to areas of risk. And then we conducted risk assessments based on a virus that we're still learning a lot about, we still don't know a lot about. It started off with fever, then it, uh, fever, cough, shortness of breath as being the three symptoms that we're using for triage to identify possible uh, suspected uh, people having symptoms of this COVID-19. But now those symptoms now have expanded considerably. We now have a, such a large list. One of the things I would add is that even the, the COVID-19 patients that I, or residents that I have seen in, in nursing homes, we have seen a lot, a lot of diarrhea and we've also seen vomiting. And then when I've taken a swab and I've taken a swab of that vomit and I've sent it to the lab, it's come back COVID-19 positive because I thought if we, we just run a GI panel, it might be norovirus or, or something else. It might be a gastrointestinal problem that I'm missing. And I'm actually seeing that we're seeing a lot of bodily fluids and those bodily fluids, vomit and diarrhea, actually increase our risk assessment and therefore we need to put on more personal protective equipment and focus on our cleaning and disinfection as well as our spill management. From a personal perspective, when I started working with staff on all the different areas that they work within a nursing home, their own personal risk ass assessment, they don't just, cut, don't just conduct once a day, but many times a day, what are you worried about? What are you concerned about? How does SARS-CoV-2 infect you? How does it inside your body? And the answer is it gets in through your, the mucous membranes of your eyes, your nose or your mouth. And we call that protecting your holes. So now that you know you have to protect your holes, how are you going to do that? And then we have a discussion. Why, is there, why, why did we tell 330 million Americans to start wearing a face covering? which covered their nose and mouth, but we didn't actually tell them to cover their eyes. And here you're working in a facility where we have wonderful people, wonderful residents. We come from our families, our loved ones, that we, we have to protect our loved ones. We go home from work as well as protect our residents. We come to work, what do we do to cover our nose, mouth and our eyes? That's your first risk assessment. And you don't just do that once a day, you do that every time you move into a different location, different room of your nursing facility, your nursing home facility. And that led us to personal protection equipment. And what was really interesting is that long-term care facilities, nursing homes aren't in the game. They aren't in the game of procuring the sort of personal protection equipment that we use say in hospitals. They didn't have those relationships. We had to initiate and develop new contracts, new relationships, new partnerships with companies, organizations, distributors 
to get the necessary personal protection equipment we needed. Many of the staff I work with have never put on and used a Tyvek suit or a waterproof suit or pants or trousers or anything else. They've never used an N95. They've never been fit tested for an N95. They've never been shown how to do a user seal check, how to ensure that you have a, 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 a proper seal when you put your N95 on, both by using a positive pressure uh, check by breathing out and by breathing in using a negative pressure check, user, user seal check. They've never done that. They've never worn a face shield for long periods of time. They haven't worn eye protection while doing their job. And also the, the question I asked everyone, when do you break out the personal protection equipment you've got that you highly value? Is it the day of when you get your first pay, uh, resident with symptoms or you get that first laboratory test back? Or is it now? Is it now when we, when, when we don't have anything and we start to practice and we start to get used to it and we start to get familiar with it? And so many nursing homes that I went to had, had some stock of personal protective equipment that they were saving, they were storing, they, they highly valued this and they were keeping it for the day off. And then a lot of the staff were saying, but we've never worn this before. So we brought that back. We actually started getting some, some personal protective equipment that we'd used for training. We got people familiar with it. And we did that through a buddy system, a system of observing you when you put it on and observing you when you take it off. And that other point that I wanted to make was that every year at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Centre where I work, I have to be fit tested for an N95. I have to, have to be um, medically found medically fit to wear an N95 respirator. I then go and do a fit testing test and they give me the model that I wear. It's a 3M model regular and, it, and I have it stamped. I have to carry um, my fit testing N95 respirator fit test card. But more importantly, on the back of that card is how to do a seal check, how to put it on properly, how to fit it properly, and how to do a positive pressure check and a negative pressure check. And so I let a lot of the, the, the staff in nursing homes just take a photo of this and say, that's it. That's what we have to teach everyone. Because if we're going to put these on for the very first times in our lives, we want to ensure that we use them the way they're designed to and they provide us with protection from water droplets and virus particles. And if we have to extend that use or reuse, we want to ensure that we store it safely and we, we, we reuse it and put it on the right way as well. And what we've seen throughout all the nursing homes I've been to is that we're very visual in what we do. People need to be, reminded, to be reminded as we do our risk assessments, we use our traffic light system, we've put up lots and lots of signs. And this is quite, this is quite disturbing for the staff as well as the residents. Especially this identifies that this person, when you go into this person's room, and, and remember, we are going into long-term care facilities, facilities where are their home. We're going to someone's home. And when we go into someone's home, they're now telling us, do you have your goggles on? Have you got, have you got your gloves on? Do, are you protecting your eyes, nose, and your mouth? And this creates quite a lot of anxiety, but it's quite scary for both staff and residents. And then we had a discussion about, for example, a respiratory protection or a program. Many of the nursing homes ha have never done a respiratory protection program. They talked about, well, maybe what, what, what would, what would the, the residents that need protection tolerate? Could we actually put on a procedure mask on a resident? Would they like that? How would a memory care resident react? How would someone else uh, of a certain age react? What's the best thing to do? Have we tried to do this? Have we practiced this? Have we explained this to the residents what we're trying to do? And this create, creates this whole environment of anxiety, unknown, and, and, and an anxiety of fear. And so what, I want to reiterate, while we received lots of paper documents, when we actually went to implement and develop the how-tos, many of the residents that I work with will not put on a, a, a procedure mask. They don't want to be covered up. But what we did find, some of them would, would, would wear a face shield. And so if I have a resident who's coughing and can't control that coughing, we can't put them in a mask, but we put them in a face shield, which again provides... And again, we can clean and disinfect that afterwards. And I want to, want to reinforce 
that it's not just about the personal protective equipment. And again, we have engineering controls, administrative controls, but so many nursing homes I've gone to put so much emphasis, the companies that run them put so much emphasis on personal protective equipment. And what, they try to, what they've tried to do is standardize and make us all look like CDC or make us all look the same, where actually where we work in a part of the facility or with whatever residents we work with, work with based on our own risk assessment, the risk is different, it varies. And again, many of our residents don't like us, don't, are fearful, are scared, are frightened when we start getting dressed up in this personal protective equipment, if we haven't explained to them, or if they are, have the inability to understand what we're trying to do to help protect them. And so again, it's not just about the PPE. But as we've done our risk assessments in nursing homes, We've actually sat down and said, well, we now know from our risk assessment of the building, our risk assessment based on our job description and what we do, the task we do each day, that risk is not uniform throughout the building. And therefore, the personal protection equipment we need to, do, to use to mitigate risk is not standardised, not uniform, based on a risk assessment. So what we've developed from our risk assessment is a personal, is a personal protective equipment algorithm and a personal protective equipment matrix such as this one which talks about the job description, the tasks that certain people do. They talk about the clinical conditions of our residents, the potential exposure and contamination, and then we define what our personal protective equipment requirements are. But then we've also gone on a bit further and said, what if this happens? What are the unexpected events? Diarrhea, vomit, other bodily fluids uh, that may be spilled. What do we do then? And, and, and if what we're wearing now, does that mitigate the risk of a vomit or a diarrhea or other bodily fluid. And so we don't all look like the CDC diagram or photo. And I wanna highlight here that we work now in pairs and we call that the buddy system. And this is like what firefighters do and other professionals do, what like scuba divers do. You don't go and scuba dive on your own. You always scuba dive with a buddy and you work out how to use hand signals and communicate. And you work, you keep looking for that buddy as you scuba dive and, and enjoy looking at the coral and the fish. In nursing homes now, where people used to work on their own, they don't do that anymore. They work in pairs, they work in buddies buddies and the buddy watches you put on the personal protective equipment but more importantly when you take it off and they ask how you're feeling and throughout the day we use thermometers to take our temperature we share our wellness program with each other of how we're feeling but we've had to improvise and if you look at here I am in the middle I'm in a nursing home today I'm teaching I'm doing workshops I have my waterproof jacket on that I bought for about twenty dollars and I've got my waterproof pants on that I bought for about $30, and I've got waterproof shoes on that I can spray down with soap and water, detergent or disinfectant as I move between rooms, as I move between facilities. I have my eye protection on, I have my N95 that I've been fit tested on, and I have my face shield. The two nurses next to me, unfortunately, we're, nursing homes didn't have those relationships. We couldn't buy, we couldn't procure what we might see in an emergency department in a hospital. And so we then, from first principles, uh, from a risk assessment perspective, we had, to say, we had to come back and say, what can we get that's waterproof? What can we get that's available locally to put on so that we can go onto these rooms where the patients have COVID-19, they're coughing, they may have diarrhea, they may have other conditions. What can we do when we go into a patient's room that is negative and we want to protect them from outside the environment? Because in a perfect world, if we just left all our residents in our nursing homes now, and we could close the door from the outside world, we know that movement is our enemy and that would stop them getting infected. So by improvising, by putting them into like rain jackets like this, with a night with, with they have buttons, I can spray them with soap and water, detergent or disinfectant. My biggest problem I had was that both in hospitals and nursing homes, so many people were wearing last year's clothes, 2019 clothes and not 2020 clothes, when we've got this outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 that's causing COVID-19. And so when I go into nursing homes, when I take my disinfectant, my spray bottle, and I said, right, can I spray your shoes? Because there may be virus on it. No, these are my best shoes. They cost $400. Then that's what you wore in 2019, but don't wear them in 2020. Get something that can get wet and I can spray with soap and water or disinfectant. 
What about your clothes? If I protect your eyes, nose and mouth, why are you putting a scrub top on or a top on that at the end of the day, end of the day, you have to pull up over your head and I've been trying to protect all day your eyes, nose and mouth, but by pulling up that scrub top over your head, you've now, we don't know whether there's virus on it, but if there is, you've now put that virus all over your face. So use zippers, use buttoned uh, type tops or put waterproof jackets over them. And so we're doing a lot of improvisation. We don't live in a perfect world. It's really hard to get stuff at the moment, but we're making it work through a risk assessment and we're ensuring that our frontline workers, our essential employees in nursing homes are safe. And our training, and here I am wearing again my waterproof jacket, my waterproof pants, but I'm wearing a power air purifying respirator or a PAPA. Why? Because they, I'm trying to surge trust. They don't know where I've been. And I have to work with these two nurses in a nursing home here, ensuring that we're training, we're practicing. We practice putting on gloves. We practice taking off gloves. We practice putting on our, uh, our gowns, our waterproof gowns. We practice putting on our masks. We practice putting on our face shields. We practice cleaning and disinfecting. And we do that outside, out of the facility, outside of the facility, even when we've got positive COVID-19 residents inside. And we're constantly training and we're constantly evaluating and observing and retraining. Another example here, we're training. And here again, we're outside the building training and we all carry cell phones and we use those cell phones to make training videos. So we make our own training videos and here we are using the buddy system where we're helping put someone put on a gown. Now the problem with this gown here, it's not waterproof. And so when I talk about what's your personal risk? Well, I wanna protect myself from the virus. How's the virus transmitted? Through water droplets. So if I had a glass of water now and I threw it on your gown as you're dressed here now, where's that water gonna go? It goes through the gown, through my clothes, onto my skin. Does it provide you the necessary level of protection that you need when you go into a patient's room that's positive for COVID-19? And the answer is no. So many nursing homes, assisted living uh, and care facilities have tried so hard in getting the right personal protective equipment, but they haven't been given the best advice or guidance and they've bought stuff that doesn't work, especially if you've got active virus transmission. Other areas, we've had, to, we've had to take existing rooms and turn them into anti-rooms, areas where you can don or put on the PPE, as well as areas where you can take off the PPE. And here's an example here where we've used a, curt, a, a, a shower curtain system with rods in a room. Again, we've put up a physical barrier to protect those droplets from spreading outside of this room into the hall. We can come in in our dirty PPE through one, through one entrance, we take our PP off, we, 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 we do it in our, in, we, under supervision as a buddy system, then we go in through the other side into and have a shower. We shower and then we put on uh, either clo new, new, new clothes or we put on new PP depending on the task that we're going to do. And we've done this in many nursing homes. We've set up these anti-rooms. Again, I can then take disinfectant or soapy water or detergent, uh, dishwashing detergent, and I can then spray down the shower curtain and clean and disinfect them and decrease the viral load. Once we're in that room, when we take off our PP, often we don't have the money, the resources, the stuff, the space to store more PP. And very often in the real world, we have to extend the use of that personal protective equipment and reuse it. So now we've hung it up. Again, we spray it. I have, we, here's a spray bottle in this photo here, either full of soapy water, detergent, or even disinfectant. And we will spray down um, the, those, these, these plastic waterproof garments. We'll let them air dry before they're put back on. And, and even if you have a buddy, even if you have someone to help you put on the personal protective equipment, what I like to do, and here we have the, the directions uh, printed out on the wall, which to me, in my personal experience, aren't that helpful because no one has the time to actually read those. So as we practice putting on, before you go into that resident room, I like to look at myself in the mirror just to, to give me confidence to ensure my personal protective equipment is on, my, my, my face mask, my eye protection, my face shield is on properly, and that I look, I look safe. And the same thing when I come out, my face shield might have moved, my face mask might have moved, and I can check in the mirror whether it has, and then I can then do a risk assessment, understand what I need to do as I'm doffing or taking it off. 
a very common reality that we're seeing in many nursing homes is that even though the workers are positive, the associates are positive, we have positive residents, many of the, of the associates or workers have not been sent home. We just don't have enough staff to send people home. We, we have residents that we have to look after. It's their home. We're in their home and we need to look after them. And so what we've done, we've actually divided. We've, we've created those zones, like I showed you before, using the, uh, the traffic light system, red, yellow, and green, where positive workers can work with positive residents. It's not perfect. It's not ideal, but it's making the best use of the resources that we have. And the other administrative workers and kitchen workers and negative workers will use other routes, other elevators, other stairwells to move throughout the building. But also have a look at the buttons here on this elevator. We've covered them in plastic. Why? They're a high touch area. We cover them in plastic. We can spray them with disinfectant throughout the day. So again, lots of standard operating procedures came out. Uh, I went to a facility the other day. They had 35 PDF documents. Another facility I went to had 16 PDF documents. And again, people don't have the time to read them, understand them and implement them. And we have to understand we're working in environments that are predominantly, I'm working predominantly with female workers. Everyone's different. We need them to do all the same thing to mitigate risk to ensure we get the same result, don't get infected. And more importantly, as I teach, and again, I teach adults. And I teach adults because adults learn by doing. So it's all the workshops focus on learning by doing. We actually do drills, we do work throughs, we do exercises, we do what if scenarios. And as we go through those workshops, I'll ask, did you understand the standard operating procedure? Could you physically do what I'm asking you to do to ensure you're safe? Was the outcome the intended outcome? Can different individuals achieve the same level of safety that I need them to? And to do that, we create observers. We create people that will conduct behavioral observation and they'll ask questions or they'll observe and watch while, while a procedure or, some, or an activity is being, being done. So for example, is Pat wearing the gloves? And you would answer yes or no. Is the risk high enough? Pat, why aren't you? And you ask the question, Pat, why aren't you wearing the gloves? Let's get you some gloves and put them on. And again, behavioral observation data, having a checklist person is just one tool used in the safety industry. But, in, but what we're trying to aim for is consistency. Consistency of understanding the risks, mitigating the risk, and consistency of protecting those holes, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. And again, we've been, I've been working all my career in personal protective equipment. I've been dealing with diseases all my life, those diseases that have no cure and no vaccine. I spend a lot of time training and wearing personal protective equipment. But I want to, to again, stress to you, you've got to evaluate it for, 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 uh, and mitigate fatigue, exhaustion and complacency. Because when do we make the mistakes? when we're tired and fatigued and when we're donning or oh, sorry, when we're doffing or taking it off. We need to ensure that we have the constant training in place. Just giving someone personal protective equipment is simply not enough. We have to train and we have to practice. Again, we're very short on staff. I was in a, in a uh, house, uh, a nursing home the other day, about a hundred residents, about 77 staff, how many housekeeping staff did we have? Three. It's not enough. So now we're looking at force multipliers. We're looking at ways of training and increasing the numbers of cleaning and disinfecting staff and creating zones throughout the nursing facility to ensure that we can do that safely. And here I'm, I'm training a group of cleaning and disinfecting staff. Here's the cart. We're looking at the disinfectants and our methodologies for, for, for cleaning first and then disinfecting high, high touch areas. And what we've learned through our whole experience of COVID-19 is that no one reads labels and that we're now procuring and buying a lot more disinfectant than we did in the past. And we have a very steep learning curve to understand how to, one, use it effectively to kill the virus, but as well to you how to use it safely, not to damage furniture and other uh, furnishings, but also how to use it safely to not hurt our employees or our residents. And so we have to ensure that everyone understands or we work out a way of, of uh, 
translating and distributing that information of how to read that label first, how to identify what the risks are and, and, and how to use the product properly. And so what we find, and again, I'm in my 50s, and the font on the back of the label of the disinfectant is way too small and I have trouble reading it. So a lesson learned to all the manufacturers out there of disinfectant, you've got to make this font bigger. The other challenge is, is that most of us don't take the time to read it. And it's really important that we are focusing on disinfection. We're going for a six log reduction kill of this virus every time we use disinfectant. And it's important that as we start to bring more disinfectants, more chemicals into our residents, and we do that safely, we have to refer to the EPA list N, the EPA registered disinfectants for SARS-CoV-2 virus that's on this website here. But we also have to go back to the product and read the label to find this EPA registration number. And when we put, that, when we put this EPA registration number into this website, it will tell us what the wet contact time is in minutes. That's how long the surface, pack, when we spray it with disinfectant, has to stay wet to ensure that we use the chemistry in the product to get the maximum benefit to inactivate or kill the virus. And again, hopefully in the future, supermarkets will be selling disinfectants not by pretty labels, not by price, but by EPA registration numbers, so we actually know what we're buying and how effective it is and what it's effective against. More and more equipment is being purchased and procured by nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Backpack sprays. Most of the nursing homes I go to have never used handheld or backpack sprays. Now they're putting in ways to um, distribute uh, at the right dilution disinfectants every day. So we're seeing equipment like this on the, on the, on the right here, which is a, a system for distributing disinfectants so you can bring back your spray bottle and fill up throughout the day. Again, we're training staff, not just the housekeeping staff, because I've been that, in that same nursing home where I was the other day with about 100 residents, 77 staff, but only three cleaning staff. The high touch areas, the areas of highest risk for, trans, for, for, for touching and transmitting virus have to, has to be cleaned and disinfected many times throughout the day. And in some places, we're doing this every hour or every two hours. Three people can't do that. So it's important that all the staff now start having access to spray bottles of either soapy water or disinfectant. They understand the safety issues of using disinfectant. And then at any time when they go into a room where they touch, they spray and let it air dry to kill the virus. Because what we found was the housekeeping staff weren't following the associates in and they had no idea what they touched when they were in the room. And as you can see, here's someone doing observational data to see how they use, that they use the disinfectant properly and that they're safe but they also spray the, spray the high touch area to ensure that it has the right amount of minutes for the wet contact time. We're, re, re, we're revisiting, retraining how to clean non-porous hard surfaces. Clean first, disinfect second. But again, as, we, as more house cleaning staff come on, as well as more associates get involved in becoming you know, virus killers, we actually have to train them properly and safely on how to clean and disinfect appropriately throughout the residence. The other way that we've, we've done, we've seen more hand sanitizers go up. And my, my discussion has always been, if you've, if you've got available water, then use soap and water. But all these high touch areas, another way we can, we can do, we can cover them up with and use that damage is put over plastic over the light fixtures, plastic over the elevator features. And all we have to do now, we can still use the light switch and we can spray it throughout the day with disinfectant. Other people that work in nursing homes, emotional support activities like musicians are coming in. And when musicians, on how to wear appropriate personal protective equipment, as well as how to clean and disinfect their instruments or their cases that they're bringing into the, the, the nursing home. Laundry is another issue. The laundry, both replacing towels, bed sheets, as well as collecting towels and bed sheets. What sort of personal protective equipment do we need? How do we transport 
towels, bed sheets, pillowcase from known COVID-19 residents down to be laundried compared to those that we don't know have, uh, those that uh, don't have the disease. All the different systems have to be set up and have to be, ma have to be managed and supervised as well as clean and disinfected. So it's created a lot more burden and a lot more work. Food, everyone still needs food three times a day. How have we trained the kitchen staff? How have we then trained the kitchen staff to clean and disinfect their carts or their trolleys after delivering the food? But how do we deliver food to a COVID-19 positive resident in their room? And then intakes that we have to put on personal protective equipment, protect our eyes, nose and mouth, and also then ensure that we go in, we can deliver the food as well, pick it up and bring it back out. And then we have to then protect the utensils, the plates, the knives, forks, glass, we make the kitchen covered in virus. Just waiting for the next slide to change. As we go through personal protective equipment, we're seeing more waste. How do nursing homes that haven't in, in traditionally in the sorry in the past handled a lot of infectious waste? And we're seeing large you know, large collections in boxes of infectious waste. And that's causing a problem in our waste, and we have to really revise and retrain and, and, and rewrite a lot of our waste management programs. Again, this is an example, this slide of a wellness check. Everyone who comes to work has their temperature taken. Again, ensure you understand what the normal temperature ranges are, because there can be user error when using a no-touch technology like this one. It gets, it gets recorded, and then questions get asked. Again, I want to finish up, but we talk about the buddy system. We always work in pairs. Uh, and here's a, a colleague of mine that we, when we were training in pairs, again, you can see us wearing our waterproof jacket, our waterproof pants, as well as our, 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 our mask for our protection for our nose and face, as well as our, our shield. And again, this is just one, one method that we've done through a risk assessment of ensuring that we protect ourselves, but also protect the many facilities that we visit throughout the week for training. Again, as well as taking the temperature when we arrive at work, we also emphasize that all associates should be taking their temperature at home in the morning and the evening and through, through the wellness program that we've established and through the buddy system, share their temperature and how they're feeling with their buddies and their colleagues and ensure that where is that critical temperature? What temperature are we really, do we want to ask some more questions? We're not going to send you home automatically. We're going to ask some more questions to see whether your temperature has increased because you've been out in the sun or for other reasons throughout, throughout the month or the week or the day that we're working. So again, constant temperature checking, but also constant questioning of how you're feeling is part of our buddy system. As well as being concerned about risk assessments and floor plans in the facility, do you have a whole household plan at home? Do you have outside clothes? Are you wearing your work clothes home? Do you have a re-entry zone in your house? Where is it? Do you take those clothes off? Do you then have a shower and put on your inside clothes? And these are inside clothes that are comfortable and never leave your house. We find a lot of our associates have stories like this where they have their outside clothes and the inside clothes. They have a process of doing this, but they haven't shared those stories. Stories. They haven't taken them to scale. So it's really important as I find these, these, these islands of excellence, these outliers, these people that are, that are actually understanding or will do something different to mitigate risk, they, we need to have a, a platform to tell those stories and share those best practices so other copies and replicate them. Again, I want to, we want to emphasize, we, we, we practice, we train, we, uh, we know that personal protective equipment can create a hazard through Hazards through our, it affects our vision, our movement, our walking, they become hot, and we need to get used to wearing personal protective equipment before we get more, or we have our first COVID-19 patient. The last slide I want to, want to end, and this is what I talk about with every facility, every nursing home I go to. 
eventually, and this is happening very soon, governors and mayors throughout the US are going to start opening up the communities. Everything is going to go back to some sort of movement and movement is our enemy. What do we do and what does that mean for us in the nursing homes? That means that we have to remain vigilant. We have to continue doing our risk assessments. We have to protect our residents. But we know as we walk out of these residents, these nursing homes, back into a community that's moving more and people are, more, uh, uh, are not staying the physical distance that we're seeing over the last you know, few weeks to months, we're going to see more possible virus transmission. So I put the question to them, what are we going to do? How through the buddy system are we going to support each other? How are we going to tell our loved ones, our husband or wife, no, I can't go to that dinner party. No, you can't have your friends over because I work in a nursing home and I need to protect my colleagues and my, and my residents. And with Mother's Day coming up, Memorial Day, July 4th, it's going to get even harder for us to explain to other people the risks that we take the vulnerabilities of our residents that we have to protect. And it's going to make our job a lot, lot more and a lot harder. And when I tell people, how long do you think we're going to have to keep wearing personal protective equipment? How long do you think we're going to have to keep using the buddy system, the wellness checks, and increasing the supervision to one to decrease transmission of this virus, but also to maintain a high level of vigilance for infection prevention and control as well as the hand hygiene, as well as the proper waste disposal. And most people are saying it's going to be at least 12 months. I have no idea how long it is, but I know the plans that we're doing right now in nursing homes are for at least 12 months as we go through our holiday season, as we go through flu season with the next winter season. We don't know what this COVID-19 disease or this SARS-CoV-2 virus is going to do, but we know that within nursing homes, we're properly trained, we're prepared, we're doing risk assessments, and we know this is going to be around, be around for a much longer period of time. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Gavin. Um, there was only one comment that I need to mention before we open it up to questions. Um, when you refer to protecting your holes, um, Dan indicates they call protecting the T-zone. So either way would work. Um, so protecting uh, the what? Protecting the T zone. T zone. Oh, I haven't heard that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, are there questions, comments for um, Gavin, or perhaps strategies that you're doing above and beyond what he's shared? Um, now's the time that we could either open up your mics or put those into the chat. Hi, Gavin. This is Nicole Osavala. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, so I assume when you're going into these sites, you, um, you're invited and they're expecting you to take them through training? Uh, it's a good question. So uh, I've been doing this now for two months and I started off doing it in hospital emergency departments around in five states, uh, working in different hospitals. And that led me to meet some people in nursing homes and uh, memory care facilities. And they said, I asked them, well, you know, we, we've already seen it. We would already seen what had happened in Lakeland over in Washington. We knew what had happened in cruise ships. We know what, we, we, we knew what would, this virus could do in a high density population, which is a nursing home. And they said, Oh, would you review our documents? So I actually started this work as it's in, and this is paid work. This is contract work. I started this work by reviewing documentation. And what I found was there's so much documentation out there, people were drowning and they couldn't interpret it. And it was written at the PhD level. It was so hard to interpret. And so I said, well, adults learn by doing. Let's see if we can do some hands-on workshops and create a cohort of master trainers. And once we created a cohort, and I'm training 32 people this week, those 32 master trainers next week are going to start training 400. And so in about two weeks' time, 32 master trainers will train 400, and hopefully we've, we've made them feel a bit safer. We've increased their skill sets, their competencies, and hopefully we're doing a good job to ensure they understand what the risks are and how long we're going to be in this, and it's going to be for a long time. Thank you. Yeah, um, we have, we've been doing outreach with the Pennsylvania Department of Health, um, calling nursing homes, and in sites that we've identified with outbreaks, we've offered 
to do some on-site advising and coaching. And it's been met with kind of a hesitancy. Um, and I don't, you know, sometimes you, um, if you don't know what you don't know or that you're not doing it well, you assume that as long as you have the PPE, you're safe. And I think that's what I'm finding a lot is they're so um, fixated on the PPE supplies, they forget about how important proper donning and doffing is and all of the other environmental contamination. And just in a few brief conversations when they've kind of led us on the inside, so to speak, um, it's been very eye-opening to see major gaps in, in what's happening. And, 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 and as I teach my students at Penn State, where I teach my courses there, I tell them you can't surge trust. Well, guess what I'm doing right now? I'm surging trust. And this is not what I teach. And, and so what I need to do is I need to sit there and say, here's a what-if scenario. You go into a patient's room, or a, a room where there's a COVID-19 patient. We know it spreads by droplet. What are you wearing right now? Well, they gave us this gown that's not waterproof. Water goes through it. We've got this mask. What about your eyes? Oh, they didn't give us anything for our eyes. Well, how do you feel about that? And I let them do it through a lens of risk, and they give me the answers. I'm like, has to come. So I think what you're saying is keep at it. <laughs> yes, but so think about as university professors how sometimes we teach by problem solving case case scenarios i create i, I write ex, i write case scenarios if this happened to you today where are your face shields oh they're in the box how many of you have actually worked with a face shield on no one do you want to work today when you have your first COVID 19 positive case or would you like to practice today and i get the answer oh can we practice first and so i'll write these little you know little paragraph scenarios this could happen to you and i hope it doesn't i really because you guys are fantastic I, I love you to death i hope it doesn't happen to you but if it does what would you do and and unfortunately they're controlled by corporate and the corporate headquarters say you must look the same you must look like cdc you've got to do this without saying what are the risks so if we if we can teach for university professors risk risk assessments i think that's going to change the whole paradigm Thank you for that. Are there other questions or comments for Gavin or for anyone on the line? Well, if not... The, the, night, shift, the night shift's about to start, Jackie. So I've done the, the morning shift, I've done the afternoon shift, and now in this nursing home, I'm in the night shift's about to start, so I'm gonna get some dinner now, and then I'll be here till about 11 o'clock tonight. Well, please stay safe um, and thank you for joining us again. Um, are there any last questions or comments before we wrap up? Uh, I had a comment. Thank you, go oh, ahead. Actually, I think Gavin, you already addressed that. I think we're struggling with, well, we're already struggling with the morning shifts, but God knows what happens with the evening and night shifts when the staff is even um, lower than usual. So. What you're saying is you're doing sessions for all shifts separately? Oh, I, I've been in nursing homes all night to help the very limited number of staff because I the, the, the contract cleaning staff that are here work from 7.30 to 3.30 and they're gone. They've packed up their cleaning carts. They've taken away their disinfectants from 3.30 to the next morning, 7.30 we will find there was very little cleaning done. Now I've had to train all this stuff going, here's your spray bottle. We need to still spray with soapy water or disinfectant, those high touch areas. It doesn't stop just because the cleaning staff leave. You, you now, need, even though you're carers and you're on the night shift, you need to start becoming virus killers. And so I've actually had to sit with those stuff saying, where do you think the risk is? Where did you touch? How do we spray? I know, and again, a lot of the residents, they get up in the middle of the night and they wander. We have a lot of wanderers in this one. And they'll walk around and we get, actually, we get very close to them. We have to show we're protected, but we, we, we have to show we care and get them back to bed. So, yeah, I, I'm with you 100%. The nighttime stuff has been neglected. Hopefully more of us can get out there and help them. Thank you. 
Well, thank you again, um, Gavin, and thank you everyone for participating. Remember that you're able to collect CMEs for today. Just complete the survey that comes out after the session. Um, as mentioned earlier, all materials will be shared. Um, finally, we hope you'll join us for our next ECHO session scheduled for next Tuesday, May 12th at 9 a.m. And that will be on hidden grief in the age of COVID-19. Please continue to watch your email for further session information.